Yes, hello there and welcome. Now I want us to look at a biology paper for Form 2 and let's begin with the first question. So the first question is asking, name the most appropriate tool that biology students can use for the following collection. And now the first one that we have been asked is crawling animals. So which apparatus will biology students use to trap crawling animals? So that one is always the pitfall trap. As you can see, this is the pitfall trap which is used for trapping crawling animals. So the next one is asking flying insect. So which apparatus will be used for catching flying insect? So the best apparatus to use in this case will be a sweep net. So a sweep net is the best one to use for catching flying insect. Now, what you should never say, you should never give your answers only a net. Because if you only say that the answer is a net, you're going to get it wrong. Because remember, we also have fish net, which is used for capturing fish or aquatic organism. So you should be specific and mention that these apparatus, or rather uh, the flying insect, we only use a sweep net to capture the flying insect. And never say just a net. If you only say just a net, remember, you're going to get it wrong. So the next apparatus, we can also say uh, the apparatus used for catching aquatic animals or fish. So in this case, we are going to use a fish net, uh, which is the best one to use for this case. And also not to forget, we have the putter. What's the function of the putter? So the putter is always used to capture insects on the back of the trees or insects um, uh, found crawling on the wall. So that's the function of the putter. So uh, for the putter, you suck on that other side and then uh, this other side that it is free you now capture the small insects that are found on the back of the trees or on the walls or on the ground so basically those are the apparatus that the question was asking but first of all let's ask ourselves what is an apparatus if you have been asked define an apparatus what will you say an apparatus is so the term apparatus mainly means anything used in the laboratory to carry out experiment any equipment used in the laboratory to carry out experiment, that is what is called an apparatus. So for example, if you use a spoon, that becomes an apparatus. If you use a beaker, that is an apparatus. So any equipment used in the laboratory to carry out experiment, that is an apparatus. And also in biology, we have the term specimen. What does the term specimen refer to? So if you have been asked to define the term specimen, so we'll say that a specimen, this is anything taken in the laboratory for experiment. So if you take anything or any living organism you take in the laboratory for experiment, that is an apparatus. So anything that you want to experiment on, if you take it to the lab or you experiment on that, that automatically becomes the specimen. So let's go to the next question, which is question number two. So it was asking, state the name given to the study of cells. So what is the name given to the study of cells? So the study of cells is referred to as cytology. So yeah, remember that the study of cells is referred to as cytology. So the next one was asking, state the name given to the study of classification of living organism. So for the classification of living organism, we have taxonomy. By taxonomy, this is the science of classification or this is the study of classification or you can say this is the study of grouping of organisms and placing them into correct groups of origin and distinct so that is taxonomy so we have seven taxonomic units and as you can see these are the seven taxonomic units whereby we begin with the kingdom phylum or division class order family genus and species so here the second one after the kingdom we have phylum or division if you if you have been asked to list the hierarchy of classification and you omit either phylum or you omit division so that you say something like kingdom division class order you have omitted the phylum or you say kingdom phylum uh, class and then you continue you are going to get it wrong because in writing the hierarchy of classification you must list them as they are phylum or division so uh, like whereby phylum refers to animals division refers to the refers to the plants now, for example, if you only say kingdom division class order, it will mean that you have not put animals into consideration. You are only focusing on the plants. 
Yeah, and also, if you only say kingdom, phylum, and you continue, it will mean that you have ignored the plants. Plants are also a living organism. So that's why when writing the hierarchy of classification, always make sure that you have written both of them. Uh, kingdom, phylum, or division, meaning that animals and plants, and then you continue. So make sure you have not made that mistake. So it's supposed to be kingdom, phylum, or division. Then you continue up to the species. If you have been asked, define the term species, what will you say? So species, this is the smallest unit of classification whereby the organisms can naturally interbreed to give an offspring. So maybe for example, if it's a lion, a mature lion, it can get another mature lion and interbreed to get an offspring. Yani, nile zipatem toto. So they can naturally interbreed to get a fertile offspring. So that's the definition of a species. So... Speaking of this number two, we see that we have branches of biology because cytology is a branch of biology, taxonomy is also a branch of biology. Not to forget that we have three main branches of biology, whereby we have microbiology, we, uh, we have botany, and we have zoology. Botany is the study of plants, zoology is the study of animals. Just from the word zoo, zoo is where animals are kept. Therefore, zoology is the study of animals. Microbiology is the study of microscopic organisms. Now, if you can be able to remember, uh, in Form 1, we studied about cell physiology and also we studied about cell specialization. Now, in cell specialization, we looked at uh, the definition of cell, tissue, organ, organ system, and the body. So, for the cell, the study of cell is referred to as cytology. So, if very many cells are brought together to perform a specific function, we'll have a tissue. What's the study of tissue? The study of tissue is referred to as histology. Then if many tissues are brought together to perform a specific function, we have an organ. If many organs are brought together to perform a specific function, we have an organ system. Many organ systems make up the body, so don't forget about that. Also, uh, we have very many other branches of biology which must not be confused with the main branches of biology. So remember, the main branches, there are only three. The other branches, we have about 15, 15 or more or so. So let's go to the next number, which is asking, list the two types of respiration. So the two types of respiration, remember we have aerobic respiration, and then we have anaerobic respiration. What is aerobic respiration? So the aerobic respiration is a type of respiration whereby the organism must use oxygen in order to produce energy. So that is aerobic respiration. So the organism must produce, uh, yeah, the organism must use oxygen in order to produce energy. And then the next one is anaerobic respiration, whereby this anaerobic respiration is whereby organisms do not need oxygen in order to produce energy. Like for example, so we have the bacteria, we have the protozoa, some bacteria, that is some protozoa, etc. So for respiration, we see that it mainly takes place in two main processes, whereby the first one is glycolysis, don't forget, and the second one is always the Krebs cycle. So that is respiration. What is the definition of respiration? So many students tend to confuse between gaseous exchange and respiration. So if you have been asked to define or differentiate between respiration and gaseous exchange, so what are you going to say? So for the gaseous exchange, you'll say that gaseous exchange, this is the process whereby respiratory gases pass through respiratory surface. Or you can say like this, Respi this is the process whereby respiratory gases, example oxygen, and carbon dioxide pass through respiratory surface, that is e.g. the gill filament, the, tr the tracheal system, the alveoli of the lungs, etc. So for the definition of gases exchange, you must always make sure that you have not said this is whereby oxygen is taken in and carbon dioxide given out. In that, you are going to get that answer wrong. Why will you get that answer wrong? It's because we see that some organisms take in carbon dioxide and they give out oxygen. Some organisms take in oxygen and they give out carbon dioxide. So if you only commit yourself to saying that this is the process whereby oxygen is taken in, carbon dioxide is given out, it will mean that you have not put the other organisms into consideration. And that's why you are, you are going to get your answer wrong. So the best definition is that you'll say that this is the process whereby respiratory gases, that is oxygen and carbon dioxide, pass through respiratory surface then you can list them if you want if you want you can still leave them alone while respiration this is the process whereby food is chemically broken down in the body to release energy 
That's the definition of respiration. Food is chemically broken down to release energy. So don't forget about those two definitions. They mostly confuse students, but if you can be able to understand them, then you're good to go. Also, the other thing is that students tend to confuse between respiration and digestion. So, because they, they have somewhat similar definition, whereby for digestion, you say that this is a process whereby food is chemically and mechanically broken down in the body in order for absorption process to take place. That is digestion. While respiration, this is the process where food is chemically broken down to release energy. So for digestion, remember, we have chemically and mechanically for absorption. Respiration, we have chemically to release energy. So don't forget about those two definitions because you can be asked to differentiate between those two. And remember, to differentiate, you must use a conjunction or you must use a table for correct differentiation. So let's go to the next number. And it's asking, define the term species. So we have already defined the term species, whereby you said this, uh, this is the smallest unit of classification, whereby the members can naturally interbreed to give a fertile offspring. So that's the definition of a species. So in that, the same, same question we have letter B, whereby it's asking, a tiger is known as Panthera tigris. As you can see, that's the name of the tiger, Panthera tigris. Identify two mistakes uh, in writing the scientific name. So identify the two mistakes that have been committed in writing the scientific name. So the first mistake that has been done is that these letters are not italicized because the rule is that if the scientific names will be typed, therefore they must be italicized. If they are typed, they must. Here they are typed, but you, we can see that they are not italicized. So that's the first mistake. So the second mistake is that the species name is beginning with a capital letter. So the species name in scientific name must always begin with a small letter. In this case, it is in capital letter and that's the mistake. So in this case, we had those two mistakes whereby the species name is beginning with a capital letter. The name has not been italicized. So let's just go through the rules of writing scientific name or the rules of binomial nomenclature. So the first rule is always saying that the genus name should begin followed by the species name. Also, you can say that the species name should always uh, follow the genus name. And also, if these names are written or are handwritten, if you write them using your hand, if these names are handwritten, they must be underlined separately. If you handwrite them, they must be underlined separately. If you type them, they must be italicized. So those two rules, make sure you are not confused. You will only italicize when you type them. You will underline separately when you handwrite them. So the other rule is that if uh, for a newly discovered organism, it should be given a scientific name. So if even you discover any, uh, any organism, you should give it a scientific name of your own and then let all the other scientists to know what you have done. So these are among the rules in binomial nomenclature and mostly they come in exam maybe about three marks about five marks depending with the with the examiner how they ask the question so the other question in that was explain why a leopard and a tiger cannot breed yet they belong to the same genus so explain why a, a tiger and a leopard because they all belong to the cat family which is panthera so they all belong to the same genus which is panthera but we see that they are of different they are of different species so since they are of different species, they cannot interbreed. Just the way we defined the term species and we say that species, this is the smallest unit of classification whereby organisms can naturally interbreed to give a fertile offspring. Now here, we see that the leopard and the tiger, they are of different species. Yes, they are of the same genus, which is Panthera, but they are of different species. Now since they are of different species, that means that they cannot interbreed to get an offspring. Yani, has the way patam toto, because Ziko kwa species different. Iko in this species, this other one is in a different species. So that's the answer to that. So question number five. The next question was asking, a cell was magnified 200 times using a light microscope whose eyepiece lens magnification was times 10. So the eyepiece magnification of the light microscope was times 10. Then the question is asking, what was the magnification of the objective lens? So you have been given the magnification of the eyepiece and then the question is asking what was the magnification of the objective lens. So remember, 
This question, we have already been given the magnification, whereby we have told that the cell was magnified 200 times. So if the eyepiece magnification, that one mag uh, lens, the magnification is times 10, what was the magnification of the, of the objective lens? So here, remember, for us to calculate magnification, we calculate magnification using the formula. Magnification is equal to the eyepiece lens times the objective lens. So if you can be able to multiply the eyepiece lens times the objective lens, you are going to get the, the total magnification. In this case, we have already been given the magnification, which is times 200. We have already been given also the eyepiece magnification, which is times 10. So we are only being asked what's the magnification of the objective lens. So this is simple. So you just divide. Uh, if you cross multiply it correctly, you will just divide 200 divided by 10, and then you get the magnification of the objective lens. So the magnification in this case is times 20. So here most students get it wrong. It's so obvious. Most students get it wrong. Why do most students get it wrong in this question? So most students get it wrong because they omit the multiplication sign, which is times. They omit that times. Not this. If you calculate magnification and you, omi you omit the times either in the working or in the answer, you are going to get it wrong. Because for you to calculate magnification, that times sign must be there. Be it in your working and also in the answer, it must be there. If it's not there, that section you are going to get it wrong. And that's why most students get it wrong. So always know that 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 time sign must be there for you to calculate the magnification. Never omit that sign. So the next question was asking, explain the photosynthetic theory in the opening and closing of the stomata. So explain the photosynthetic theory in the opening and closing of the stomata. So in this photosynthetic theory, first of all, as you can see, this is the internal structure of the leaf. The internal structure of the, leaf, of the leaf, remember, at the topmost part we have the cuticle, then followed by the upper epidermis. So after the upper epidermis, we have the palisade mesophyll cells, then we have the spongy mesophyll cells, and then, then on the other side we have the xylem, the phloem, and then below we have the guard cells. So you see, the function of the palisade mesophyll, as you can see, the function of the palisade mesophyll is that these cells, they have a very large number of chloroplasts. What's the function of chloroplast? Chloroplast help the plant to photosynthesize because it is inside the chloroplast whereby the process of photosynthesis takes place. Now, in the palisade mesophyll, there are very many chloroplasts. And therefore, since we have very many chloroplasts in the palisade mesophyll, it will mean that the main function of these cells is photosynthesis. So in the palisade mesophyll, photosynthesis mainly takes place. Now, in the spongy mesophyll, the spongy mesophyll cells also have some traces of chloroplast. Since they have traces of chloroplast, it will also mean that the spongy mesophyll cells also photosynthesize. But the main function of the spongy mesophyll cells is for gaseous exchange. But since they have chloroplast, they also photosynthesize. Below there, we have the guard cells. The function of the guard cells is to open and close the stomata. As well, we see that the guard cells also have traces of chloroplast, which means that if they have traces of chloroplast, it means that they also photosynthesize. Now, we have three main cells that are used for photosynthesis. We have the palisade mesophyll cells, we have the spongy mesophyll cells, and then we also have the guard cells. But now this question is asking, explain the photosynthetic theory of opening and closing of the stomata. Now, in this opening and closing of the stomata, mainly we are going to focus on the guard cells, whereby the, fun the main function of the guard cells is to open and close the stomata. Remember, if we have one pore, that is called the stoma. If we have very many pores, they are called the stomata. Very many pores are called stomata, one is called the stoma. So for the guard cells, we see, since they have very, or they have some traces of chloroplast, it will mean that they also photosynthesize. So, during the day, this is what happens. So, during the day, the chloroplast in the guard cells photosynthesize. If they photosynthesize, what will happen? They, uh, there is the formation of simple sugar. Now, this formation of simple sugar, what exactly happens is that if the sugars are going to be formed inside the guard cell, it will mean that the osmotic pressure inside the guard cells is going to be high. Now, if the osmotic pressure inside the gut cell is going to be high, therefore, water is going to move from, uh, from the region of low concentration surrounding the gut cells 
and into the guard cells whereby the concentration of sugars is very high through the process of osmosis. So uh, uh, like if the water has moved inside the guard cell, it will mean that the guard cells are going, are going to absorb water, then they are going to they are going to bulge outwards and then the stomata is going to open. So the stoma is going to open. So that is during the day, that's what happens. So there's the buildup of sugar inside the guard cells. So the buildup of sugar inside the guard cells raises the osmotic pressure inside the guard cell. So as the osmotic pressure has been raised inside the guard cells, so the water are going to, to move from a region of low concentration surrounding of the guard cell and into the guard cells whereby uh, in the guard cells, there is high concentration. So as this happens, the guard cell will become turgid and then the stoma is going to happen. And this explains how the stomata opens during the day. So during the night, we see that there is no process of photosynthesis taking place. And since there is no process of photosynthesis taking place during the night, it will mean that there will be no formation of sugar inside the guard cells. So since inside the guard cells there will be no formation of sugar, the osmotic pressure will be lower, it will go low. So it means that since there is no buildup of sugar inside the guard cells, so inside the guard cells the, it will be lowly concentrated. Yeah? So in Dania guard cells it will be lowly concentrated. So if inside the guard cells is lowly concentrated, it will mean that outside of the guard cells it will be highly concentrated. Therefore, the water will move out of the guard cells from a region of, of low concentration inside the guard cells and outside, whereby there is high concentration. So as this happens, we see that the guard cells will lose water and then they'll, they'll shrink or they'll become flaccid. So if the guard cells shrink, then the stoma is going to close. And this explains how the stomata closes during the night. So that is just the theory of opening and closing of the stomata uh, in the, by focusing on the photosynthetic theory. So by during the day, we'll say that during the day photosynthesis takes place inside the guard cells, there's the buildup of sugar. Therefore, uh, uh, the water will move from a region of low concentration and into the guard cells whereby uh, there's high concentration, that the guard cells will become turgid, they bulge outward, the stoma will open, and then you go during the night, what happens is that photosynthesis does not take place, and therefore what happens is that the osmotic pressure in the guard cells will decrease, uh, then the water will move out of the guard cells and into the surrounding and the guard cells will remain shrunken or the guard cells will shrink. As this happens, the stoma will close. So that is all about the photosynthetic theory of opening and closing of the stomata. So remember we have other theories of opening and closing of the stomata whereby we also have the potassium ion theory for opening and closing of the stomata. So apart from that, let's look at the next uh, the next number and it's asking state the two types of slides used in the microscope so we have two main types of slides that are used in the microscope so the first type of slide we can use in the microscope we have the temporary slide and then we have the permanent slide so what's the difference between these two things the temporary slide and what what is a permanent slide so the temporary slide is a type of slide that is made that is made for the current use only so the temporary slide, if you want to observe maybe an onion cell, so you'll get an onion and then cut into very thin pieces, put it in a slide and observe. So a temporary slide is a slide that is only used for the current use or the current experiment only. After use, the slide is discarded and then that's the end of the experiment. So that is a temporary slide. Well, a permanent slide, this is a slide that can be used over very many experiments over very many years. So these are specially prepared slides that can be used for a long time or over very many years. They have been specially prepared. So venye ziko and yo ziko. So we utatumia and then unaiweka. The other person aneza kuja atumia and then aiweka. Ni kama, it's just like something you are buying from the, sh it's like a textbook. So a textbook you can use and then you keep it in the library. Again, you lose Another day, keep it in the library. So that is a permanent slide. It can be used over a long period of time. A temporary slide is a slide that is only used for the current use only. So after you have prepared the specimen and then you have used it, so you discard that slide. So that's the difference between a temporary slide and a permanent slide. So the question B to that was asking, step, state four steps 
of preparing a temporary slide. So we have different steps of preparing a temporary slide and we have four steps. So the first step is always sectioning. What is sectioning? So sectioning, this is cutting very thin pieces, very thin pieces of the specimen. So the pieces of the specimen must be cut very thin in order for light in the microscope to be able to pass through. So that's the most important part in sectioning. So you cut very thin sections of the specimen in order for light to pass through the specimen for clear observation. Then the second step is fixation. So what is fixation? So fixation, this is treating of the section that you have just cut. So this is treating of the specimen using, you can use 1% glacial ethanoic acid to treat the specimen so that the parts or the, the, the cells themselves in the section, they are not going to die or they are not going to dry up. So that is fixation. So after fixation, the next step we have, uh, we have staining. So this next step is staining. So staining this is by, so why do we carry out staining? So we carry out staining in order to make the parts of the cell or the cells in the section to be visible. So that's the reason why we stain. So we stain in order to make the cells or to make the organelles inside the cell to become visible and distinct. So that's the main function of the specimen whereby we can use iodine, we can use eosine, we can use methyl blue, methyl red, or we can use also phenolphthalein indicator can also be used in this, in this experiment. So after that, the last step we have mounting, whereby in mounting, first of all, you place a drop of water on the slide. So after placing the drop of water on the slide, you, you lie the specimen at an angle. So you, you don't just drop the specimen. So you lie the specimen at an angle and then you spread it over the, the drop of water in the slide. So after that, the last step in mounting is that you cover using a cover slip. And then also the cover slip, you must light at an angle and not just bring it straight. So you light at an angle in order to cover the specimen. Why should you not bring the cover slip straight on the specimen? You should avoid bringing the cover slip straight on the specimen in order to avoid trapping of air bubbles. Because if you trap air bubbles, they are going to give you a wrong reading while observing using the microscope. So those are the four steps used in preparing temporary slides. So the first step, remember, is sectioning. The second step, remember, is fixation. After fixation, the third step, remember, is staining using a suitable stain. And then after that, the last step is now mounting. So after you have carried out all these steps, you have a complete temporary slide that can be used for the experiment. So the next question is asking, what are the two types of sections used to observe an organism? So the two types of sections used to observe an organism, remember, we have the transverse section, as you can see, and then we also have the longitudinal section. So we have those two. So we have the transverse longitudinal and also the cross section, as you can see. So, so those are the differences in the sections that you have. So the longitudinal section, remember, you cut the section from top to bottom. So that is longitudinal section. So you cut the specimen, maybe if you have an orange, so you cut the orange from top, to bottom and then you observe the specimen this side and this side so that is longitudinal for the cross section you cut the specimen across the latitude like that or at the equator so longitudinal you cut top to bottom cross section you cut across so those are the two main types of sections that can be used to cut the, uh, the specimen for observation so the next question is asking define the term binomial nomenclature so what is binomial nomenclature? So binomial nomenclature, this is the scientific double naming system of living organism, whereby an organism is given a genus name and a species name. So that's the full definition of binomial nomenclature. So in this definition, always avoid saying that this is the double naming system of living organism, or this is the double naming system of organism, or this is giving an organism two names. You're going to get it wrong. Because you also have two or three names. Uh, your parents, when they gave you a name, they didn't follow the rules of binomial nomenclature because you may find someone is called James Edwards. So it will mean that these two names, James Edwards, it will mean that the parents didn't follow binomial nomenclature. What am I trying to say? So what I'm trying to say is that when defining binomial nomenclature, you should always mention scientific. If you don't mention scientific, your definition is wrong. 
So you must mention that this is the scientific double naming system of living organism. So it must be scientific naming. Uh, whereby this is the full definition whereby you'll say that binomial nomenclature, this is the scientific double naming system of living organism whereby an organism is given two names, the genus name and the species name. That's the full definition of binomial, binomial nomenclature. So take note. So the question B to that was asking, set two rules to follow in binomial nomenclature. So the two rules that we have just discussed earlier. So the first rule is that the genus name should come first followed by the species name. The second rule is that the genus name should always begin with a capital letter, the species name a small letter. The third rule is that when handwritten, the gena, uh, uh, when handwritten uh, these names should be underlined separately. So if you handwrite them, the names should be underlined separately. The other rule is that if you type these names, so these names should be italicized if you type them. And then the last rule is that a newly discovered organism should be given a scientific name. So a newly discovered organism should be given a scientific name. So example, that uh, species of grass that was discovered in Kikuyu, which was given the name Meladogyne kikuyunesis. So it, it will mean that this grass species was discovered in the Kikuyu region. So since it was discovered in the Kikuyu area of Central, so it was given that name Meladogyne kikuyunesis. So if you discover any organism and then you look in the encyclopedia, you find that this organism has not yet been discovered. So if you discover any organism, you should give it a scientific name. So that is uh, the other rule of binomial nomenclature. So the next number is asking, describe digestion process in the mouth. So describe the process of digestion in the mouth. First of all, let's define what is digestion. So digestion this is the process whereby food is mechanically and chemically broken down in the body for absorption process to take place. If you have been asked such a question, describe the process of digestion. So always the first thing you do, define that word that you have been asked to describe. For example, if you have been asked, describe, uh, describe the process of gaseous exchange. So if you have been asked, describe the process of gaseous exchange. So it is advisable for you, first of all, to identify the parts of the gaseous exchange. It takes place, we have the nose, we have the trachea, we have the lungs, and then now begin describing what you should describe. Now here in digestion, we have been asked, describe the process of digestion. So the first thing that you do, define that word. So define what is that word that you have been asked. Whereby in this case is digestion. This is the process whereby food is mechanically and chemically broken down in the body in order for absorption process to take place. So why did we say mechanically breaking down? Why did you say chemically breaking down? So for the mechanical breaking down, we see that we have the teeth. So the teeth are used to crush the food. They are used to grind the food or bring the food into very tiny particles. So since the teeth is used to break down the food into tiny particles, that is mechanical breakdown of food. That's why the mechanical part is coming in. So the chemical breakdown of food, this is now where we are going to use the enzymes, we are going to use the chemicals like hydrochloric acid in order to break down the food and for the enzymes to act on the food. So that's why we are saying mechanically, meaning the teeth, and then chemically, meaning all the other chemicals and enzymes in the body that act on the food. So that's the definition of digestion. So for the process of digestion, we see that food is taken into the mouth in a process called ingestion. So you must begin from that step. Food is taken in the mouth in a process which is referred to as ingestion. So during ingestion, food is taken in the mouth. Uh, like and after food has been taken in the mouth, so what's the next step? So the teeth will act on the food or the teeth are going to break down the food in order to increase the surface area over which the amylase enzyme from the saliva is going to act on the food. So the, the saliva contains the enzyme which is referred to as amylase enzyme. So the amylase enzyme digest starch to carbohydrates in the food. So uh, like in the mouth, this is where the digestion of starch to carbohydrates begin. So after the amylase enzyme has acted on the food, then the tongue rolls the food into bolus or into spherical structures, which are referred to as the bolus. And then after rolling them into bolus, the tongue pushes the bolus on the gullet or on the trachea. 
and that you have finished about the digestion in the mouth it's as simple as that so the digestion the digestion in the mouth the main steps to follow first step to follow mention ingestion so food is taken in the mouth in the process which is referred to as ingestion now the food is in the mouth what is the next step that is going to take place so the next step that is going to take place is mastication so the process whereby uh, the teeth is breaking down the food into tiny particles, that process is called mastication. So during mastication, food will be broken down into, into very tiny particles uh, to pave way for the salivary amylase to digest starch to carbohydrates. Then after that was the function of the tongue. The tongue will roll the food as mastication process is taking place. And then finally, the tongue will roll the food into spherical mass, which are called bolus, and then push the bolus on the gullet in a process which is called swallowing. So that is the definition, that's the description, and that those are the main processes that take place in the mouth. So in the mouth, remember, is where the first digestion takes place. Starch is digested to carbohydrates. So never mention that in the mouth starch is digested and then you leave it like that. If you leave it like that, that is wrong. So you must say that it is digested from this to that. So you'll say that starch is digested from this, the digestion of, of carbohydrates. So whereby you'll say that in the mouth starch is digested to carbohydrates and that you're going to get it correct. So those are the main processes which take place in the mouth. So the next question is asking, state one disorder of the circulatory system. So we have very many disorders of the circulatory system. And then remember, circulatory system is just uh, is the blood circulation which is in our bodies. So whereby we begin from the heart, the heart has four chambers, the right auricle, the right ventricle, the left auricle, the left ventricle. And these ventricles, they assist to pump the blood out of the body, back to the heart, and again, to the body so for the heart as you can see the heart has four chambers and then we have the two valves so from the vena cover the blood enters the heart so the blood enters the heart through the vena cover and into the right auricle so here in the right auricle remember we have deoxygenated blood and then below it we have the tricuspid valve so why is this valve called tricuspid valve so it is called a tricuspid valve because it has three openings or three flaps. So since it, it has three openings or three flaps, that's why it is called tricuspid valve. So from the right auricle, the blood enters the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. There's a very easier way for you to identify these two types of valves on the right side and on the left side. So it just forms the acronym TB. Yeah, so that's the acronym. TB, whereby this side is tricuspid, then the left side is bicuspid valve. So if you can be able to understand that acronym, then you're good to go. So just remember the valves TB, tricuspid on the right, bicuspid on the left. So blood from the right auricle enters the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. So uh, uh, like as the blood is now inside the right ventricle, so you see that the right ventricle will contract and then the blood will be forced into the pulmonary artery through the semilunar valve. So one thing you should remember is that on the right side and on the left side, those valves, they have the same name. So those valves are called the semilunar valve on the right and on the left hand side. So the blood from the right ventricle will pass through the semilunar valve and into the pulmonary artery. From the pulmonary artery, the blood will enter the lungs. So uh, what happens in the lungs? So in the lungs, there's the purification of the blood. And then from the lungs, the blood goes back to the heart by using the pulmonary vein. So from the lungs, blood enters the heart through the pulmonary vein and into the left auricle of the heart, into the left-hand side or the left auricle of the heart. Now remember this blood is oxygenated blood. So on the right side, we had the oxygenated. On the left side, we now have oxygenated blood. So from the right auricle, the blood will enter into the right ventricle through the bicuspid valve. Why is this valve called the bicuspid valve? So it's called bicuspid valve because it has two flaps. So this bicuspid valve has two flaps. So remember, the tricuspid valve has three flaps. That's why it is called tricuspid. And then the bicuspid valve 
on the left hand side it has two flaps and that's what it's called bicuspid valve so blood from the left auricle will enter the heart through the uh, through the bicuspid valve and into the left ventricle so as you can see the left ventricle is muscular than the right ventricle so why is it that the left ventricle is muscular the left ventricle is muscular because it pumps blood at high pressure that is one the second thing is that it pumps blood through a very long distance and back to the heart so that those are the two reasons why the left ventricle is muscular or is very thick the first reason it pumps blood at very high pressure the next reason, reason is that it pumps blood to a very long distance from the heart and uh, from the heart into the body and back to the heart. So that's why it is very muscular. So from the left ventricle, the blood goes through the, uh, the semilunar valve and into the aorta and to the rest of the body. So that is, that's the pathway by which blood flows from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart, and then all over the body. So this type of circulation whereby blood enters the heart twice because in the right we see that blood enters the heart and then leaves to the lungs so it leaves the heart to the lungs and then blood is going to come back to the heart and to the rest of the body so this type of circulation whereby the blood enters the heart from the right and then leaves and then back to the heart and then leaves so this type, this type of circulation is referred to as double circulation so why is it referred to as double circulation it's because blood enters the heart twice before leaving again to the rest of the body so we also have uh, the other term to define whereby we have the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. So if I've been asked to define between or differentiate between pulmonary and systemic circulation and say that in pulmonary circulation, the blood originates from the heart and then through the pulmonary artery, it enters the lung. And then from the lung, blood comes back to the heart by using the pulmonary vein. So you see, here we are using pulmonary artery. So from the heart, we go through the pulmonary artery and into the lungs. From the lungs, we go through the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary vein and back to the heart. So this type of circulation whereby we are only dealing with the pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, this type of circulation is referred to as the pulmonary circulation. So pulmonary circulation, remember, it is heart, lungs, and then back to the heart. While systemic circulation, this is the type of circulation whereby blood comes from the heart or blood originates from the heart and then through the aorta to the rest of the body and then through the vena cava back to the heart. So for the systemic circulation, remember, we have the heart, the aorta, the body and then the vena cava and then back to the heart. So pulmonary circulation is heart, pulmonary artery, lungs, pulmonary vein, heart. Systemic circulation is heart, aorta, the body, vena cover, and then back to the heart. So if you have been asked to differentiate between those two things, so that is the simple, the simple definition between those two. Also, the other question you might be asked, you might be asked, uh, you might be, yeah, the question might be framed like this. Explain why pulmonary artery is the only artery which carries the oxygenated blood, while pulmonary vein is the only vein which carries oxygenated blood so uh, uh, like why is it pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body the only artery carrying the oxygenated while pulmonary vein is the only vein carrying oxygenated blood so the answer to this is is that the pulmonary artery is the only artery which carries deoxygenated blood because it carries blood from the ventricle which is right ventricle so the ventricles, uh, uh, the blood from the ventricles is at very high pressure. So since the blood from the ventricles is at very high pressure, therefore, it is only an artery that can be able to support that blood comfortably and take it to the place whereby it is needed. And that's why the pulmonary vein is the, the pulmonary artery is the only artery carrying the oxygenated blood because it receives blood directly from the ventricle, which is the right ventricle. So the other one, why is it that pulmonary vein, this is the only vein in the body carrying the oxygenated blood. So you'll say that it is the only vein carrying oxygenated rather. It is the only vein which carries oxygenated blood because it receives blood from the lungs which is at very low pressure. So the blood from the lungs is at very low pressure. And therefore since blood is at very low pressure, 
there is the risk of backflow of blood. Therefore, the veins, we see that one characteristic of the vein is that they have valves. So these valves prevent the backflow of blood. Since they prevent the backflow of blood, therefore, the vein will be the most appropriate to be placed on that side because the blood is at very low pressure. And that's the reason why. The reason why the pulmonary artery is the only artery carrying the oxygenated because it receives blood from the right ventricle, which is at high pressure. The pulmonary vein is the only vein carrying oxygenated because it receives blood from the lungs, which is at very low pressure. So that is the answer to that. So the main question was asking, State one disorder of the circulatory system. So the first disorder which can be brought about by the circulatory system, in the heart we see that uh, we have stroke, uh, we have um, heart attack or cardiac arrest. So this heart attack is mainly brought when the coronary artery of the heart is punctured or ruptures. So if this coronary artery is going to rupture, it will mean that the heart will not receive enough oxygenated blood, so the cells are going to die. So if the cells are going to die, Therefore, we'll see that uh, the heart will not function. So in a process which will lead to cardiac arrest or heart attack. So the next one is stroke. So if the blood vessels of the brain are ruptured or are torn, so it will lead to stroke. So apart from that, we have, heart, uh, we have high blood pressure. Whereby high blood pressure, it will mean that the blood vessels uh, will be they'll be very narrow. So since the blood vessels will tend to be narrow because of maybe fat deposits or calcium deposit, it will mean that the blood inside the blood vessels are going to pass at very high current. So this very high current or very high pulses will tend to rupture the small delicate capillaries. So if the small delicate capillaries have been ruptured, it can lead to the to heart attack if this is the coronary vein of the heart or the capillaries of the heart that have been ruptured or it will also lead to stroke if the blood capillaries of the brain have been ruptured. So that disorder is high blood pressure. So high blood pressure is a very serious disorder. So apart from that, we also have arteriosclerosis, whereby this is the deposits of calcium on the walls of the, the walls of the blood vessels. So if these calciums are going to be deposited on the walls of the blood vessel, it will mean that there will be only a very narrow space for blood to pass through the blood vessel. So this very narrow space of blood to pass through the blood vessels are going to increase the rate at which blood is passing. So if it increases the rate at which blood is passing, it will mean that the heart, the heart will be pumping at very high, uh, the heart will be pumping at very high strength. This very high strength will lead to, it may lead to high blood pressure because blood must pass in that very narrow space. So this very narrow space is going to lead to high blood pressure. So that disorder is called arteriosclerosis. And also we have arteriosclerosis. So the arteriosclerosis is deposits of calcium on the walls of the, uh, uh, the, walls of the, blood, the blood arteries or the veins, which will lead to increase in blood pressure. Arteriosclerosis, on the other hand, is now deposits of fats into the walls of the blood vessel. So these deposits of fat will do exactly the same same thing that arteriosclerosis will do. So whereby these deposits uh, will lead to the very narrow passage of the blood inside the blood vessels which will also lead to high blood pressure. So this is the condition which is called varicose veins whereby it is mainly brought about by the failure of the valves of the legs to function and mostly it affects the females because of the overweight but not restricted to females because it can it can affect anyone so it is brought about by the valves of the legs failing to function properly so since they fail to function properly there's the buildup of fluid inside those veins so the buildup of fluid makes the veins to swell and then that's what happens if you someone is suffering from the varicose veins